Hey everyone, and welcome to F4 Obsessed, an OST bonus analysis. On our weekly show, we discuss F4 Thailand from a symbolic and meta perspective. In this show, we are offering a mini analysis on each music video that we've seen so far, starting with Who Am I? I'm Ty, your host, and my co-host is Marie Claire, who I call MC. Say hi, MC. Hello. Hello. Uh, We want to remind you guys to like, subscribe, interact uh, with this video, share this video on any social social media platforms that you're on, and also check out our weekly show where we discuss each episode in depth, as well as our mid-season symposium symbolism summary where we cover all the symbols and metaphors and themes that we have seen so far in the show all right let's get into this one music video and all of the stuff that it is offering to us yeah i i just wanted to talk like it's really important that we're using we're recording this mid-season right so Mm -hmm. Uh, We've already seen a lot of the symbolism that the show has presented thus far. And so we're using that to kind of analyze the videos. And trust me, when we say we actually needed to wait this long to see kind of what they were doing with the themes of the show and the motifs and what they were telling us, it's really, really important to like recognize that the stuff that we've been talking along this whole time actually is also available in Mm -hmm. these OSTs. And that's because like from a media theory perspective, a communications theory perspective, these are part of the story. And so we thought it would be really, really fun to analyze them about what they're doing and what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh, Briefly before we get into who am I, Mm -hmm. um, music videos are like almost a fundamental part of film because they have in, in a way existed as long as cinema has existed because in the earliest forms of cinema, which were primarily experimental films, Mm -hmm. um, many of them popping up during the surrealist movement, they were always set to music, usually Mm -hmm. classical works, but there was always music. Same with the silent era of film. It was like Um, all the action that happened on the screen didn't necessarily have lyrics, except when the actors spoke and then they would have like a, you know, a a cut to what they were saying. Mm -hmm. Um, But everything was driven from the music and the emotions and these shows on their peak emotional moments actually rely on the OST to sort of accentuate and push the boundaries of what the actors and the maison scene is giving us in the moments. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And this all popularized through, you know, the cartoon era with Fantasia, with musicals, like Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend with, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Marilyn Monroe and like her famous dance number with that. Yeah. Yeah. the Beatles really popularized the idea of a band, sort of a boy band, Mm -hmm. uh, presenting themselves and telling a story with help. Um, And then the modern age of music videos really started to kick off this promotional concept of music videos being part of the storytelling of the song. And that it was like, not just an opportunity to kind of sell the band, but also for the band to explore visual and sometimes audio representation of their art in a different way. And actually started in Australia in the 1970s, where they were trying to take these promotional clips that these uh, producers were sending out to promote Mm, their music and tried to create programming for teens using them. And then Mm -hmm. that eventually morphed into different versions, which eventually ended up for North American audiences in MTV. Yeah. And that hit the, like from the eighties on, it's been nothing but like popularizing music videos as part of the statement. And many times music videos will be released as the initial release of the song. That's Mm -hmm. the first time that people hear the song is a music video with the visuals associated with it. Right. Yep. And Like I'm obsessed with music videos. Yeah, me too. Because they're often (laughs) experimental and symbolic. Yeah, 
I've been obsessed since I was in middle school. Um, and the early aughts, I guess is what you would call them. Like, or like late nineties, early two thousands when we still had lots of music videos on like VH1. So I was like raised on music videos. <laughs> so what is your favorite music video tie? So <laughs> I asked you this beforehand so you could prep and you weren't. Yeah, like- I was torn. I was very torn because like nostalgic wise, like, you know, something that has stuck with me for a long time is obviously very different than like what I like now. Um, I think that my kind of nostalgic music video is Dave and Cowboy by Boards of Canada, which is literally just footage from uh, the first guy who ever dived from space. Yeah. And fell to earth and it's the footage from his perspective. And then he dives into it it, and the, the music video syncs that with like the music, but then, uh, at the end of it, he falls into the water and it turns into like more of a surfing video. And to me, it just is very symbolic of like falling. It's really weird, but yeah, it's like falling into the womb. Uh, and when I watch it, I kind of feel that way because that how the music is but I also really like alt j music videos because they tend to tell a story they tend to be very symbolic and obviously I'm a big k-pop fan so I really like k-pop music videos so I have a lot of favorites (laughs) yeah I mean that's great my my favorite is REM's uh Mm -hmm. losing my religion which is just something that you you have to consume madonna has amazing symbolic videos yeah. as well yeah um but losing my religion has just a special place in my heart because my dad was really into kind of this talking about media and actually did like loved that video and we would talk about it a lot and how it's about um the death of religion through science and um you know how the renaissance really like had an impact on how people view religion and science but really you can't divorce the two you kind of need mm. both you need like this spirituality and how we try to replace it with machines and things like that it's it's a really fascinating video um mm. i highly recommend it to anybody it's it'll it'll blow your mind and you're like what is happening in this video um, yeah <laughs> i'm also like more recently obsessed with on uh, BTS on. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Uh, yeah. I did a video about on yeah, it, and how it's like a collective unconscious, uh, yeah. dream type of thing. Yeah. I, oh, I love it so much. I love it's, on it's, it's so good. Yeah. 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 It's fascinating, but like also who am I is my like new obsession. <laughs> like, yeah, right now, because it means right so much to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's really it speaks to all the themes that we've been talking about uh from the first episode to the mid-season you know through through episode nine like everything is packed into this music video it's so good and then it just like makes me ask like what is this show (laughs) Like, (laughs) like what are you doing to me why are you taking up so much of my mental ram yeah it's it it takes up a lot of space in my head yeah, this show does that and uh mm-hmm. they created a glorious ost so far to go mm. along with it yeah definitely it, it's interesting where we're at right now the history of hani yori dango is obviously it's all every single version is made up of idols yeah and idols don't just act right they also yeah. are expected to sing. They're expected to do media circuits. They're expected to be perfect in like so many ways. They're expected to dance sometimes in some some of Model. these cases. Uh, yeah, promote yep. things. Mm-hmm. 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 So and it started at the very beginning. Yeah, two thousand one. Yeah, two thousand one. Jerry Ann, I have a, such a soft spot for Jerry Ann. Like I love watching him act. I love watching him in. Meteor Garden 2001. If you have the visuals on your screen right now, it's the top left. That's that's 2001 Meteor Garden. That's Meteor Rain. And these guys are just, uh, they steal my heart. I think it's just so raw. I think they were just so raw and so real. Yeah. It, it just, it's great. But 
they ended up releasing three albums. They're considered to be Mando Pop, of course, which is like Mandarin pop music. Mm-hmm. Um, they've toured a bunch. I think they've toured like six or seven times. And as recently as 2020, um, they've been all over the place and they're still <laughs> quite popular. They had to change their name actually in 2007 to JVKB uh, because hmm. um, the copyright owners of Hanayuri Dango wanted to reuse the F4 name. <laughs> right. That's Obviously, interesting. Yeah. For Hanayuri Dango. Mm -hmm. Because it was being released, it was released in 2005, and the second season was coming out that year. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, What's super cool is that when Angie Chan, Mm -hmm. um, she actually was like the main still producer of this pop music group too, when she decided to re-up Meteor Garden 2018. Mm-hmm. She took some of the songs yes. that were on the original OST. Yes. And and like had been created by Meteor Rain and everything, and had the new F4 sing mm-hmm. them. Yeah. It's delightful. It's so yeah. delightful. Like I'd watch including, including the main theme, which yeah. gets played in the in the season like yep. as a live thing. Yeah. Oh my God. It's so satisfying. If you watch, I, it doesn't really matter which ones you watch before the other, but you know, if you watch either Meteor Garden and you watch the next, the other one after it, it's so satisfying because you know the songs. Like, yeah, they play during important moments, during emotional moments, during the opening. And it's nostalgic. Like, you're like, I know this song, I know the story because it speaks to the story. So it's just so good. I know you know this, but Mm -hmm. maybe the listeners don't. But I actually go into musical theory on my Star Wars podcast, all Mm -hmm. about the music of Star Wars and specifically the leitmotifs and um, sort of the themes of each character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what, what these sort of OSTs do is give us these heightened emotional moments Mm. where they specifically use the uh, sort of feelings that are produced by the characters and have them reflected with the words of the singers or they'll use an instrumental version to remind Mm. you of what is going on in the person's head Mm. because you've gotten used to hearing those songs and repetition is really really important in these osts and it's quite common in most asian media to Mm. have a repetitive ost where there's you know maybe max 10 songs Mm -hmm. i would say meteor garden 2018 is the rarity because there's like 20 songs on that yeah definitely um but you get used to a few of a few of them, like say something, I'm giving up on you, yeah. you know, and like the English oh, ones. You. <laughs> yeah. And even like, like some of the other ones, but it, it, it really is just used very similarly to leitmotif, which is, it does something to our brains to mm. hear it. It is a symbolic audio mm-hmm. symbol. Yeah. Yeah. When I think Meteor Garden, my brain automatically goes to the. Yeah. Like it, that's just, you know, I mean, you can't help it. You can't help it. But, but, and then the, and we've talked about, you know, how Meteor Garden, they share the songs, uh, depending on which version, but uh, and the Japanese version has also got a ton of earworms in it. And one of the main reasons is because Arashi, who is the band of the male lead, sang those songs. And yeah, that is just like, mm, 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 mm. because I think Hanayori Dango 2005, the Japanese version, did not use as many songs. I don't know this for sure, but if I had to guess, I would say they didn't because every single time. I watch an episode of that show. I have one of the one of the songs stuck in my head for days, and it will not go away. Um, specifically, like the first, the opening of the first season is called uh, "Wish," 
-hmm. and it's like, it'll stick with you forever. But if you're looking at your screen, the bottom left uh, picture is of Arashi performing that song live. And you could see just how dated it is. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it was very flashy. They did a little dance. It's really cute. And that's not all of F4. That's just uh, the male, the main male lead and his band. Mm-hmm. Cause he was casted in this role, you know, after he was already a part of a, uh, a band. So, and they're still around today. They're still releasing music today, which is another interesting thing. Um, but yeah, so this is like, this is an important part of Hani Yori Dango lore. It's an important part of why I think the show now is called F4 Thailand. Yep. Is because F4, it's such a marketable name. And if they release these OSTs under F4, people are familiar with that and they know what that mm-hmm. means. And they're expecting it to an extent. So it's now become kind of part of the mythos of this from a communications perspective. Mm-hmm. Where I think every version that this, I fully expect this story to be redone at some future point, even yeah. for Thailand to be revamped, maybe in <laughs> 15, 20 years. That would be really cool. We'll be here. We'll yeah. Be back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. But, but I, I truthfully think that this is part of the deal now like if for some reason japan decides to revamp hanayori mm. dango they would probably find pop idols to play the roles a hundred percent yeah easily and then they would re- re- you know release an ost with them singing it yeah and yeah. if they were if they were smart they would do it in like five years instead of 10 i'm just saying <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah like yeah. this is this is never ending like you never have to stop doing this there's, there's just so much there's so much here uh, I yeah. don't know if any other version can be as symbolic as this version. I agree. Yeah. This, this yeah. one kind of takes the cake. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> so let's talk about our first OST. Who am I? It was the first one that was released. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was the first one that was released. And, um, how did you feel about this one? Oh, uh, I when loved heard it. it. Cause it was like, we got the beginning the mm-hmm. sort of like zero episode, which is the behind the scenes. And then mm-hmm. this was released like immediately thereafter before we even got a first episode. Yeah. Yeah. I remember watching it and thinking, oh God, there's a lot of symbolism going on. And yeah. there's, a, and basically it was like the entire journey condensed into a music video, um, which was really cool. But also, I mean, we know more now. Yeah. We know more now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that they're literally in the sky in this picture. Uh, yeah, like the roof is not on top of the train. Yeah. It's literally in the sky. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Oh. What does that mean, Ty? Oh my God. So what, So can I talk about my edit thing that I did? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. I love this. Yeah. So yeah, just before we get into like the whole video, um, I love this video so much. I was, I'm obsessed with the trope of like resurrected lovers or like reincarnated lovers. And that's like something, you know, just where it kind of goes along with the idea of like karma and, you know, you're, you're reincarnated into, uh, finding basically going on the same journey over and over again to find your true love. I think that's a really cool idea. (laughs) Yeah. And like, it's kind of, it's sad. It's like tragic, but it's also because you have to find them every time you have to like look for them. And and usually there's a tragic end because you didn't get it right. Yes. Yes. But also like it's also, it's just very romantic because, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's like, if you ever watched The soulmates. Good Place. Yeah. Soulmates. It's, like It's soulmates. You're meant to for this person and you keep on finding each other. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say like, yeah. the, if everybody's watched The Good Place, like that's a modern telling of that kind of story, right? Because they have to keep finding each other and they have to keep realizing that they're in love and all of that. So I had this idea and I thought this video was the perfect kind of background it was like the anchor for that idea um so I made an edit that took from all of the previous versions and 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 kind of edited them into a video that acted as if um these two people Goya and Tom have been on this journey over and over and over again and every time that journey ends 
they symbolically die and are resurrected to live it again in the next iteration of the story. And I just think that's amazing. And it's like, it, and, and if you think about like the, the video and what, who am I is doing, it's like, it's like they, like, this is not what it's saying, but it, you can look at from, from the perspective of they are not in the real world. Like they're mm -hmm. dead. They're in, the, they're in the spiritual between. Yeah. They're in the spiritual yeah. between and they find each other on the train and they're like, wait a second. Like we have to go somewhere. We have to do something. We have to tell this story again. So they decide to do it together because mm -hmm. they're always going to do it together, like over and over and over again. From a fictional perspective, have you ever seen Lost Romance? The uh, show? Is that the one? She falls into the romance novel. And yes. Yes. And the second character, the second male lead. Yes. And his story. Yes. I've, I haven't watched the whole thing, but I watched like okay. a good chunk of it. Yeah. It's really Lost good. Lost Romance is so good. Um, anyways, Lost Romance is really good. Yeah. It's a. Um, transmigrational story that I highly recommend from Taiwan. <laughs> there you go. Taiwanese um, ones are so good. Taiwanese <laughs> dramas are so good. As Plus maybe the hottest makeout seat I've ever seen. They have such good Asian kisses. <laughs> Ugh. All right. Uh, no pressure Brighton too, but at this point you have to like <laughs> outshine. Uh, anyways, uh, but okay. I love what you just said about mm -hmm. all of this and mm -hmm. yeah in some ways because the media is iterating itself through all of these cycles it's sort mm -hmm. of like that mm -hmm. and and it, it just gives us a better concept of what these characters are going through and it also kind of has this really interesting meta awareness of the story that it's telling which of course the director patha opatha has talked about they yeah. know the care that they're giving into this yeah they know I that there's this video. Yeah. Yeah. They know that there's previous stories. They know that people are in love with those stories. They know that people are going to be comparing those stories yeah. to this one. And to, to start the story out with this OST and this music video. Yeah. It's like, it's like really setting cool. our expectations. When I saw this, I messaged you and I said, oh, we're in for something special. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and yeah. Like we were both like, whoa, what is this show going to be? Because we mm. both recognized a lot of the symbolism in it. We're like, oh, they're going full beauty and the beast They're doing, you know, and we'll get into that. But now that we're halfway through the show, finally, you mm. know, looking back on the OST and actually seeing what they're doing with the music videos, some of them are pretty standardized from, you know, what you would expect from a music video narrational mm. Uh, perspective but this mm -hmm. one in it of itself is exceptional yeah it, it very much is it's <laughs> surrealistic it's metaphorical it's conceptual mm. it's narrative within its own storyline but it also speaks entirely to this is the story of tom talking about mm. his experience through the entire plot of f4 yeah definitely definitely and there's also some from the rest of the F word too. Yes. Sorry. Which yeah. makes it so interesting. So yes. interesting. All right. So timeline. Yeah. I thought this would be fun <laughs> <laughs> to talk about, which is uh, when did the OST come out? And mm. then when did it first appear in the show? Mm -hmm. And we know who am I will be in all of the episodes right yeah. because it is the main theme of the show it does during the credits but it was not in the first episode that's interesting how did you figure that out because we don't have an intro in the first episode it goes directly into the star scene oh interesting i do i mean patha has said that he's used the light motifs yes from from different songs like, I mean, uh, I haven't had time to go back and count yeah. all the times it's used. Right. But yes, I, I fully expect the instrumental versions of these, these songs, mm. which is just the stems. So mm -hmm. with stems, this is when you have different instruments broken out in 
the instrumental version, you could mm-hmm. actually add in like the strings part of it or just the beat or whatever, and then yeah. slowly fade in to create the the soundtrack or the score behind the scenes. Yes. And I fully expect it to have been in the first episode. I just, from a, a grand presentation, it was not. Right, right. Because he's admitted that uh, One Last Cry the notes from one last cry are have been there from the very first episode Mm -hmm. um so that'll be interesting when we get to that one but but yeah like the who am i one is the theme song it's the intro yeah (laughs) yeah that makes sense like in its in its full play Mm -hmm. we haven't heard it we didn't hear it in the first episode it was in the second episode yeah um i know we've heard in the wind all over the place yeah uh one last cry as you just mentioned shooting star though is one and we'll get into that when we talk about that one probably Mm -hmm. next episode but um Mm -hmm. shooting star is like only really heard at the end of the first episode of the first episode yeah yeah Uh, that's when it popped up because I thought I'd heard it before but yeah we'll talk it makes it makes it (laughs) makes me mad because I'm like damn the episode's done I know (laughs) definitely it's fine that's all right all right let's dig in yeah the lyrics cool yeah I broke out the lyrics by uh who sings them I thought it was really interesting because the solo singer primarily in these group songs is actually the rapper known as Nani yeah (laughs) Yep. Nani is the rapper. I think that's so funny. Cause he, he like, doesn't have, he doesn't have any like experience in rap. And I think that it's, it's so like that type of character, like that fourth, that fourth F4 character yeah. to be sort of casted as the rapper, but he's doing a good job. So, and he, he's getting better as we're seeing him. So I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy about it. And I love he, Nani. Yeah. Um, this <laughs> like it, it's it's framed so interestingly like yeah there's, there's, we'll go into the actual lyrics as we get into the scenes but I thought mm-hmm. it would be really interesting just to share them and to talk about like how much each person kind of plays so primarily all the stuff in white if you're watching the YouTube video of course um is you know, everybody singing all together. Mm-hmm. Um, Bright only has kind of these very specific lines. So alone, it hurts, no escape. So much I suppress who can relate. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the seeking line before the chorus starts. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, then, it lingers a lot too. His yeah. particular, even though it's the shortest part, it lingers quite a lot, which is nice. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and we get a lot of uh, trapped emotions from Gawain's character, like mm-hmm. that character. And um, of course, Do singing for uh, Ren is just like depression land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Ooh, All right. Okay. Sky so train. I, oh. I got to talk about the setting because yes. like, okay, so. I was like, that's so interesting. They're on a train, like a commuter train. Yeah. I watched the video, thought nothing of it. Yeah. I I didn't either. That's an interesting choice. And then episode nine hits (laughs) and we have this one shot of this one tweet. Yeah. Explaining the meaning of this union between Lita's character and Tom's character. Mm Mm-hmm. The guy's family does real estate. The girl's MPC group does construction. Their logos can be seen at major construction sites or on the Sky Train. They're both mega rich, insanely rich. Hashtag time Lita. I, you know what I just realized too? What? Was the guy's icon that tweets this is the Sky. The sky. And yeah. his name is in Korean. And his at is December Sky. Yes. What the hell is the show? What the hell is this show? That's that's my question since the first episode. Uh, <laughs> but okay, so yes. the Sky Train exists. Mm-hmm. It is it is a thing in Bangkok. It's actually yep. the the Bangkok Transit System or BTS. They call it the BTS <laughs> Sky Train, not <laughs> so the bands. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it literally goes like you know several. <laughs> it's it's up above the sky. Yeah, it's in the sky. If you, if you watch, uh, interviews with like 
any of the main cast. Like they, sometimes they talk about the sky train cause like using it, if you haven't used it before, you know, just, it's just like, if you were to go to New York and you suddenly have to get a Metro card and you have to like scan it through and you have to keep moving, right. You have to keep moving through the, mm-hmm. the turn, the turnstiles and everything. And it's really kind of, it makes you flustered. I've seen the main actors of F4 talk about that with the sky train. So it, it's very much just like a very fast paced commuter train. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, they've talked about it. I, so I kind of knew about it a little bit, but the fact that they're using it like this as like a symbol is so interesting, <laughs> especially cause it's called the sky train. It's called the sky train. And mm-hmm. I, I was fascinating because I'm like, this, is this a set like that they're using these like orange bench or these like yellow benches that seem so interesting. Nope. This is literally what the sky trains benches look like. Yeah. So they used an actual sky train car to mm-hmm. film this. Except probably- for except for the poles in the middle, right? Well, some of some sky trains don't have that, right? So they found right. one without the middle poles or whatever. Got and it. Filmed it. Got it. Okay. They used they used a sky train. Yeah. And um they probably did visual effects, et cetera, because uh, there is some video visual effects credits in the underneath the OC. And again, if you haven't watched the music video, go and watch it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we should have said that before. <laughs> yeah, like go and watch it and you'll be like, oh, this is what they're talking about. But okay, so let's talk about uh symbolism of mm. trains. Oh, 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 so still on trains. Okay. Uh, right. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Let's talk about <laughs> symbolism of trains. So um if it was a subway. It has a subconscious feeling because you're yes. kind of going into the labyrinth, you're going the tunnel into the underworld. Mm-hmm. It's the journey into it's it's definitely a separation into another realm. I think they've maintained some of that because of how dark their initial the initial pieces of this are for some of the characters. Mm. They're stuck in their own maze of their curse. Ah, right. Okay. Oh, yeah. And And the key about this is commuter trains, especially like subways, Mm -hmm. you cannot pass through them without paying a toll or having a trial. Yeah. And Hmm. those we meet along the way are either threats or lifelong companions. Mm -hmm. You meet along (laughs) the, the path and it's claustrophobic to some, it's the lifeblood of the city to others. Yep. Trains, especially this one, I would argue, are also kind of like animals. They're kind of like dragons flying through the sky. If we think about like Chinese or Japanese or Asian or Korean dragons, they fly yeah. through the sky. Yeah, that's right. True, and they, yeah. they've got this and it it moves consistently like a journey with changing vistas and is also both now because you're sitting in the moment on the train but mm. also timeless because it's consistently moving. Oh, that's interesting. It's also that they follow a set path. So it's also a lot like fate. Yep. And you have sort of an expected outcome, but your experience depends on those you find along the way. Hmm. And they all find each other. They all find each other. <laughs> And there's a specific sort of crunch to them from a time perspective, because you only have so much time, Mm. Uh, you know, that there's, um, you know, you're going to get to a certain place. And sometimes the destination is mysterious because you don't know when you're supposed to get off and it could go anywhere. Yeah. Cause you can't see that far Mm -hmm. ahead, but you know that there's a path for you. It's really interesting. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Cool. It was just a train. What? It's just a train. That's all it is. And and the cookie, the cookies were just cookies, right? I mean, come on. (laughs) Everything means something. It's, it's crazy. All right. So, all right. We got some screenshots here of, I think, cause what starts out, they kind of show all the guys in their different areas. Um, so we have very specific symbols associated with each individual yes. in their own train car. And it starts Talk with them. Oh my God. It's insane. So I, does it start with 
Tom or does it start with Gawain? It starts with Tom. Okay. Uh, but like from a lyrics perspective, uh, Gawain starts the song. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And go, and uh, we'll we'll start with because I have an image of uh, Tom in the next slide. But uh, yeah, with Gawain, it's so interesting because we've talked about how Gawain's color of his true self is yellow. Mm-hmm. That was solely based on the show. That was not based on this music yeah. video, but we can clearly see that he's wearing yellow and there's green behind him and there's yellow ahead. Yeah. And, uh, and he's trapped. He's this trapped. Important. He's trapped in like this tent and he has blood yep. splattered up his arm. Like he has caused harm to somebody. Yeah. It's and it, not it's his right hand. It's it's only up his right arm. Oh, that's interesting. It, from a from a myth perspective, your left arm is a guarding arm. Yeah, and your right arm is a harming arm. So because you you put your shield in your left hand and you put your sword in your right hand. So typically, people um, like for example, like people will often get tattoos on their left arm because it's a it's a guarding factor. It's like a reminder, mm-hmm. the left hand. And also the, le- it's like the left hand path is also another part of that. It's like close to the heart. It's closest to the heart. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's uh, your right hand is the one that does the actions like throwing, like typically people are more right-handed throwing a ball writing, but your left one is the one that, um, that protects you even when mm-hmm. you're doing actions. So to me, all of these for the, for the guys mm-hmm. are all explaining this particular version of the curse that they're under. Yeah, definitely. Like this yeah. is how the curse is manifesting for them symbolically. The curse on the kingdom, which is something that we've talked about a lot in our show. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh duh, totally. Yeah. The fun it's so interesting to me that Gawain sees a light through the rips of the plastic like he's like looking for a way out but we know going from the show is looking to be very self-destructive and to continue what he's doing so the fact that like he has this like blood stain on his arm but then he's also looking at the light like this could be my way out oh I want to see that going in the show (laughs) I know I know I want to see that I think we've started to see glimpses of that with how he reacts with hunting, right? Like yes, him, him being worried she's going to fall. Yeah. 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 I, Mm. I, I think we'll get it eventually, but it it is, Ooh, it's so enticing. Uh, but yeah, then we have Ren. Oh, oh, Ren. Oh yeah. Ren and his car. Oh my God. He is like the blue. Again, we said his, co- his color is blue. Yeah, yeah, it's very much blue. And and he doesn't wear a lot of blue. So it's like, oh, no. this is really interesting that this is an entire, and it looks underwater or yeah. like uh, shadowed, uh, uh, schizophrenic in some ways because he, we get like shots of him, like multiple versions of him on screen where he's like different angles. Yeah, I really love the idea of him feeling like as if he's drowning I think that that's like a good takeaway from it because also he he's wearing pearls like his necklace they're all wearing they're all wearing chains except for Tom except for Tom yeah and we've talked about chains on the show being like you're kind of you're shackled to your curse or you're you have like a leash on basically that's like keeping you mm-hmm. from being your true self but with with Ren specifically he doesn't wear pearls on the show so I feel like that was like a very interesting choice that went along with his kind of car and like what he was where and he it looks was like he's underwater with how the movement of the lights look too. yes Yes. Um, so you're drowning. I, that's associated with depression because mm-hmm. you have no escape and you're kind of under all of this pressure to, to stay put. And he always makes himself very small in his car mm-hmm. too. Yep. He goes like into like a fetal or... position. Yeah. Yeah. He curls up and like, that's very, you know, we've talked about Ren needing a nurturer in his life. He needs, oh, 
feminine figure who can nurture him. Um, and that's, you know, going back into like the womb and like going into the water and all of that, like, that's very, that's reminds me symbolically of a boy who wasn't nurtured enough, who needs someone he wants, basically he wants his mommy. I mean, like that's, that's really what it goes back to. Um, and he wants, he wants to be cradled and he wants to be cared for, but he obviously shuts himself down around certain people or certain situations. So, oh, so interesting. And and in this, we get, um, you know, Gawain talking about how he has everything that they desire. Mm. Uh, I'm surrounded by those who admire in this life. It, this is the life that only inspires. This is me. This is me. So the, mm. this is very similar to how he talks about in the first episode, talking about the pressure being on top, yep. all of that. And then with Ren, we get the lyrics, you know, who can ever see what lies inside the only person I tried to hide the other person I tried to hide someone who's vulnerable with a heart that trembles. This is me. This is me. So this is very mm. POV of these two characters. Uh, Mm. which is also interesting, but could apply to the curse in general and to Tom. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I think that's definitely, it's like, well, this is what's happening now. This is where I'm at now. Yeah. But then the question is, the question is coming, but I want is coming, which we'll talk about. So yeah. Then the other two, we have MJ in his car, uh, which I thought that again, the lighting's, the lighting's, uh, choices are super interesting here because it makes the car look like the seats are green. Yeah. And, and he, he's lit by red. Like yes. the pressure. It's almost like the pressure of Tom putting on him. Yeah. The it's the pressure of like what he's supposed to be. Like he's supposed yeah. to be uh like the perfect and, soldier. Uh, the like yes. he's I was going to say the the perfect warrior, the perfect Mm -hmm. knight. He has to do everything to keep everything still going. And he's surrounded on the floor with Mm -hmm. all of these papers Mm -hmm. and images of himself. Yeah. Everything, how it looks on it, which is also speaks to the fact that MJ is also the one that's always keeping them together. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the pressure of like how things are perceived like he, he feels like he has to maintain this, you know, what it looks like from the outside kind of thing. So there's pictures of himself amongst the papers as well. So, and so far, like the three F three mm-hmm. have been in very dark situations. Like you can, it's cloudy outside for MJ. He's in a tent Mm. for Gawain uh Ren is like underwater yeah and then we get to Tom and it's light outside it's it's light he's in the sky yeah and he's in a garden that is dying yeah he's in the celestial garden Mm -hmm. and it's dying yeah and the light there's a light above him just a bright light above him this Ooh. sort of reminds me Ooh. of like Beauty and the Beast, like the overgrown garden around the castle. It yeah. reminds me of Sleeping Beauty and the Briar. Mm-hmm. Um, like, and <sighs> so alone, it hurts no escape. So much I suppress who can relate because he's just, and, and that's the theme. Like everybody's kind of like alone and trapped in their, yeah. in their own worlds and in their own like duties and responsibilities and their expectations of who they are. Mm. Yeah, exactly. All right. So then we get into Tom's line of the so alone, it's hard to escape. And then yeah. we see the black rose for the first time. Yeah. And we see, if you could see inside my heart. And it's eclipsed. So he sees, we see the black rose and it eclipses his face mm-hmm. momentarily before um, he stands up. And if you could look past this beautiful facade and we mm. see him walking towards where the black petals have like blown. Yeah. And who am I? Who am I? He sees Goya. He sees, and it's holding up the book. And yeah. inside of the book, this blew my mind. This, this, yeah. 
again, I get, I get kind of mad at how good this show is because I'm like, it's just not fair. Like, why is this show so good? Okay. We've already <laughs> talked about tulip metaphors a lot on our show. Yeah. And I kind of think that we were a little bit wrong. I think we were is, wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we were confused, but actually Rosalind is very smart. Mm-hmm. She's, she's holding open a book of a blooming red rose with right next to it, a fully in bloom tulip. Yeah. This is still blowing my mind so much so that I think it's in the next slide. I looked up a, <laughs> I looked up a time-lapse today of tulips growing. Um, and if you are watching this tulips initially, you know, just like any kind of bud, they look like a clump of grass. Yeah. They look like a clump of grass. <laughs> and when they burst through, it's kind of, um, sudden, like it's very mm-hmm. kind of shocking. And I have to say like the entire, the entire growth of a tulip is actually, to me, it's very sexual. I, 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 I know like you talked about like how the heroine's journey, there is an element of understanding your own femininity and your own power and all that. And some of that does parallel with like your sexual development. So watching this, I'm just like, okay, if they go this tulip route, which is something we were not expecting. We thought that Mm -hmm. Rosalind was wrong. Yeah. Like Goya is a, a grass or a weed, but specifically recognizing that tulips look like grass mm-hmm. until they don't yes and then they bloom fully and are as magnificent as roses rose. yeah like they're paired mm-hmm. in this page mm-hmm. this blew my mind like i i don't even know like what is this show i know uh, i know i hope it's blowing your mind too i yeah i found this and i was like wait a second yeah. I, well, at first I was like, maybe it's something, maybe it's a different flower. So I, I kind of like, I kept comparing this image that's in that book and I kept comparing it to other flowers and I could not find a flower that was it's, more similar than a tulip. Like it's, it's a very tulip. specifically a tulip. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. and so Rosalind <laughs> was right. Yeah. But she is a tulip. Yeah, but a, a another okay. So another thing about tulips, though, that it's really important because Rosalind is wrong, obviously, about the fact that like tulips are like overvalued or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Like roses are overvalued. Like we could go, we could go all over the place with these metaphors, and right? But one of the things interesting about tulips is that uh, tulips tend to change colors year to year depending on the conditions of of anything like the ground yeah. like the the soil content the water content shade not not enough shade whatever like so tulips can go from being like yellow one year to being pink the next year just depending on like the types of things they're being put through so i feel like there's some adaptability symbolism here with goya and that tulips and also tulips are really strong they come back every single year perennials yeah yeah and they and they multiply and they grow yes like more of themselves so we've seen goya has been mostly associated so far with dandelion seeds blowing through the wind and uh the they kind of look like wheat they look look like wheat but they're not it's like the like grass grass pods grass gone to seeds yeah yeah and we've seen that associated with her it's been very explicit it's in the opening but this might be a secret like this might be like a hint to what's to come because Mm -hmm. just like tom is turning from a black rose to a red rose like that's been told to us in many different ways uh goya could be turning from a weed to a tulip and that could be just as important Mm -hmm. and just as you know symbolic and uh, it's pretty it's pretty cool it's pretty cool given the symbolism that they've already shown us I just don't think that this was just random yeah I I I agree because at first glance you're like oh that those are just a bunch of roses but on second glance it's like no that's a tulip and from everything we see in the show that's not accidental nope (laughs) Uh, if you want to go back to the, uh, other slide, 
Yeah. Oh, the hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, she holds out, you know, they look at each other and he's like, I'm not that guy. And underneath this dreamlike mirage, Mm -hmm. you'll find a heart that's full of scars. Okay. So a heart that's full of scars. I am hurt. Mm -hmm. I am a hurt person. Mm -hmm. And she offers him compassion first, which is quite literally what happens in the show. Yes. Yeah. She She smiles, mm -hmm. hold me tight, hold me right. They walk towards each other and look deep inside. Who am I? And she reaches out for him. They grab, they start to run. Yes. Yes, they do. They run. And then we get a, a Nani's rap part after that. They, they like, they're knocking the dead garden off of the train. Like the curse is off of the train. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, I didn't catch that. I should have, yeah. I should have gra- grabbed that. Dang it. And it's, okay. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, but then we get Nani's rap, which is interspersed yes. with going. Yes. I got that too. No worries. I got oh, that too. But like the papers keep on piling up. It's mm-hmm. images of Nani or, or of the character MJ, uh, like it's all these expectations and they're both in red lights, but yeah, I really like the visuals that are used here of Nani. First of all, being like shrouded in this kind of smoky type of veneer, Mm -hmm. like it kind of speaks to him being the son of a sort of mafia type of boss. Um, and being like this, he's supposed to be like this rugged guy, but he, we know like from knowing him in the show that he's actually very soft and he cares about his friends so much. And then when he's like laying down, it kind of is him just, he's like submitting to who he is. Yeah. Right. Oh, I love that so much. Cause he's like the only one that like lays down like that. Yeah like that and kind of like being surrounded by this ever piling responsibility yeah and you can see pictures of him around him like that's that's Nani that's that's MJ right there around him again perception plan pressure like all of that and so this this rap is kind of like a mini song within the song. It's an mm-hmm. I want song from a musical perspective because he specifies the problem and then says what he wants. Yeah. And so he goes into being, you know, feeling so alone. How many nights have I spent alone? How long until the light done? You know, how long until, how far until this ache is gone? I just feel so lonely. It was that one, right? <laughs> yeah. wind, wind singing and he's so trapped in his like bubble. Like, yeah. And then someone who feels just right, someone to be by my side, someone who can shine a light. I just feel so empty. Yeah. <laughs> someone who will hold my hand, someone who stay till the end, someone who really understands, someone who won't leave me stranded before my heart will weaken, mm. you know, before my breath will soften. And then he starts to realize this and like runs down the train and we see all the papers like fly up in the air. Yeah. 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 They do. Take Ooh. me out of this deep before I succumb to this depression. Oh, and that right? matches more with Ren's, yeah. Ren's stuff. Yeah. And he starts to move. And- yeah. And this is, no. we get the Gawin- Gawin's thing too here, right? Yeah. Oh, is so, that? Uh, no. So we get like Ren, uh, like really, really trapped. We get go go in really trapped, and we get you know so alone and it hurts no escape. So much I suppress. Who can I relate? And then we get who can I relate? And we get go in like pushing out of the trap. Yeah, that he's in. And it looks. And then the chorus starts, and we have them all running down the length. Of yeah the train but like Gawain looks like he's being birthed like, oh yeah it's a rebirth it's totally a re- <laughs> this is 
classical rebirth symbolism. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they chose like plastic like that, like the kind of plastic that can like pull in that way, like this is very explicit. And, and again, they, he's they covered made this tent for him to rip out of. Yes, exactly. And they had it had holes in it in the beginning, like so mm-hmm. that he could like pull like they, and then like and uh, I can't help but think about the blood on his shirt too like being a part of like this newborn baby type of thing right because oh, babies yeah. are covered in blood and all a bunch of other stuff but he's, he's he's as a character he's ripe for rebirth yeah exactly and that's we have seen you know and we will continue to see but that yes and also uh and, and this was something that kind of threw me you, you mentioned the green leaves in his little room oh, too yeah there's like flat green flowers or something floating down from the ceiling i thought it kind of looked like clovers but i'm not sure i don't know it looks a little like clovers but they look too fake that i can't place them i thought they were butterflies for a moment but no yeah i I don't i don't know there's something fluttering down from like yeah in his in his like trap right uh but they're all Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was saying, I think, I think that the green fluttering down and the green light that's behind everything in there has to do with this, that idea of like wealth Mm. and, and luck. Um, and I think that when he leaves it, it's like him leaving that because we know that Gawain relies on his like power of manipulation and his power of wealth and his power of his Mm. name. And he's leaving that behind in his rebirth. So I don't know. That's my interpretation of it. God, I love them running down the train because like it's so it, good. In so many ways, like it's kind of like running up as uh, up an escalator. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. like running. You know, you're like on one of those moving walkways, and if you walk along with it, you advance your journey that much faster. Yeah. If you're actively doing something. Like I know some people who will like walk the length of an entire train, the ones that are connected between the cars, just to get to the front if they need to be on that side of the train. I used to do that when it's I It's kind of like that. Yeah. 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 I would walk, I would be one of those annoying people that would walk the length of the train because I if I got to the platform late and I needed to get on the train, I would just I would be like, yeah, if it showed up, I'd get on there and I'd walk to the front because I knew I needed to be at the end of the platform to get onto the escalator. And oh yeah, heck yeah. But that's so yeah. it's a, such a funny thing because like, you know, it is sort of heroin or it's it's like hero's journey kind of thing. Like why walk the path when you could run? You know, why yeah. and, why and just, run in your own way and not be trapped yeah. by what is holding you back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is how you escape. And this actually helps them clear the train. Yes. Yes. All of the things, all of their little symbols go away, or at least they get to the part of the train that is clear where they can, they can start over again. Right. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right. So we get the part where Goya stops. And she lets go. He's exhausted. Oh my God. And we know what this means now. Yes. Yes. Episode eight, episode nine. We know she has said she is so exhausted and she lets go of Tom's hand. Yeah. But then. But the train is clean. Yes. She's already made it better for them. And now they have the energy to help her. Yes. Yes. They're like, we're in this together now. Yeah. We're all here for you. We're all here to inspire you and to give you what you need. Like, let's go. Like, oh, I love it so much. So I love that when I first watched this music video, I was only expecting to see Tom. And then she looks up and we see all of them. It's yeah, so precious. They're all there to help. Like, yeah. They're all there to help. Yeah. yeah. And then we get, um, we, we get, get a, so they all run yes. and eventually they're sitting all down. So they all run and they're all sitting down together. Um, oh, but we get and, a brief reversion. Yes. I was going to say too, but we also get like MJ is the one who leads them. Oh yeah. 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 Right. Like MJ is the one who's like, 
this come on yeah. yeah we're go we, we we already started let's keep going and so it says mj go in ren, ren and then tom, tom and, and goya, goya. Yeah. yeah and and then we get like so they're all sitting but then we get this brief reversion showing kind of the curses where they're at mm -hmm. and you know we get the repeat of the chorus yeah um but they're all together and then the train sort of meets its destination it's amongst the clouds mm. and uh he holds out his hand she takes it and f3 get off the train first and then yep. tom and goya and we hear this train sound yes like the whistle we hear the tr well it's a lot of train sounds it's like the yeah. train on the tracks it's like the train stopping going it's all the train mm -hmm. sounds yeah. And then, and that's it. Like it's very ambient at the end. What yeah. you, okay. So I had my interpretation of this was like, there's a bunch of things it could be, but I thought it was cool kind of going off of episode nine that the train sounds and everything kind of feels like they've come down from the sky to get off at sort of the mortal world in a way. Like they're all like, Hey, let's go like kind of start over again. And, and that goes with your like reincarnation yes. vibe. And I love that. Yes, uh, but yes, to yes. me, they're entering into a bright light. So they're still up in the sky. Yeah. They're in the celestial realm. They're finally together from like a star bride. The, <laughs> celestials, the celestials are up where they belong. Well, free of everything. I mean, yeah. Cause like essentially the, the, the train, this whole music video is supposed to represent from the beginning of their journey to the end of their journey from what it seems mm -hmm. like so it either way works actually yeah it it it, it does they're continuing like it, their life yeah together yeah i think it's important to stay to state that in myth beyond the story it always continues so like most happy endings are not happy endings most happy endings you know they they have to go through another journey, another test, another, they have to do it all over again in their lifetime. Like if you, if you look at like folklore and myths, like it doesn't end. Um, Tom and Goya being kind of these like gods, these, you know, uh, these figures that we, we look to that have existed, you know, since what, mm -hmm. 90, 92, <laughs> um, you know, that that's kind of, to me, that's what it speaks to is like their journey is never going to be over. They just keep walking hand in hand and they'll be fine. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't really talk about the hand in hand thing completely, but I think that it is important to call out that, um, the first time they run hand in hand, uh, she is pulling him along. Yes. And then the second part is that he's pulling her along and it's really important. And then, cause then obviously at the end they get off together and they they're walking together. It's that you have to understand me and then I have to understand you. And that's the only way we can like make it through this. Like, yeah. And it's the, an equality and, thing. And this ties to Goya bringing Tom into her world and then Tom mm. bringing Goya into his world and then them finding a balance together. Exactly. exactly. Transcendent ending to the story. But again, this is the perfect OST song to it have is. as like the theme of the show. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's so good. It sums up everything. It's perfect. It's awesome. I love it. All right, uh, <laughs> that's a lot for just one of these. Yeah, we had to. We had a lot of history we, to go into to kick yeah. this off. Yeah. Woo! Fun, fun. All right. So next we'll be doing shooting star. So please look out for that one. Um, and again, this has been F4 obsessed. A deep dive. We did our. OST deep dive this time. So please sh check out uh, the rest of these. And also don't forget to check out our regular weekly show, uh, which we typically release the day after the episodes of FR Thailand come out. And you can find all those links below. Cheers. Cheers.